I'm Dr. Kamar Khan. I'm a nephrologist uh, practicing in the United States. It is my pleasure and honor to moderate uh, this webinar um, on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, this is the first of the two webinars that we are going to have. The second webinar is going to be on January uh, 12th, and I will encourage everybody to uh, attend that webinar also. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, late uh, referral and poor patient selection and uh, mechanical problems related to PD. So I've been given a daunting task uh, to introduce my professor uh, and mentor from Yale, uh, Professor Dr. Finkelstein, as well as Professor Dr. Edwina Brown from Imperial College London and distinguished guest and panelist. Uh, and uh, this is all to be done in 10 minutes. So I practiced a couple of times, so I was able to do it in 10 minutes. Hopefully I can do it again in 10 minutes here. And, uh, and this will include uh, ground rules uh, after the introduction. Most of us know Professor Finkelstein and uh, Professor Brown uh, from PSN, uh, this recent PSN, where they conducted a PD workshop and, uh, and gave very enlightening talks. Uh, I had the honor of being their host uh, for a time other than PSN meeting uh, while they were in Pakistan. And that was uh, really, uh, an amazing time that I spent with them. And uh, we became not only good friends, but uh, one other thing came good came out of that uh, uh, friendship is that uh, my professor and mentor, uh, uh, Dr. Finkelstein, uh, uh, let me start calling him with his uh, first name. So now I call him Fred and uh, I feel like I'm promoted. Uh, so before I introduce the panelists and participants, I have to um, say that uh, again, that I, I was trained at Yale and, uh, and my passion is to uh, get PD established as a, a viable and uh, alternative uh, uh, for hemodialysis in Pakistan. And uh, I have to just, give you like one minute or even 30 second story uh, how it all started and uh, because that will give you an insight uh, uh, where we are and how we got here. Uh, so I have quite a few projects in Muzaffarabad uh, and including some healthcare projects and education projects. So one of the project uh, was related to the speedy because uh, uh, this uh, people from mountains uh, which even living a few miles from away from the center or city, they, they just could not come to the uh, small dialysis center that they have in Muzaffarabad. And uh, many of the young people will die, uh, just not being able to commute. And, and that really made me very sad. And I started working on this uh, project and, and I was able to contact uh, Professor Dr. Finkelstein uh, uh, who uh, has been doing uh, like uh, some philanthropic uh, work in other countries also. And he, he responded to me and he uh, was very uh, helpful. And he introduced me to Dr. Ahad Kayyum and he said that there are some other uh, nephrologists in Pakistan who are uh, uh, working on the same initiative. And that's how we got all connected. And Ahad and I uh, invited uh, Professor Dr. Finkelstein and uh, Professor Dr. Edwina Brown to come and attend the PSN meeting. And, and that's uh, how they, they uh, were able to come and, and uh, we became like family. So, so I don't want to say anything more about PD because it's like preaching to choir. Uh, uh, the only thing that I would say that, uh, that more, more upfront work is needed to establish patient on PD than hemodialysis. So, so it is, it is more work upfront, but it, it really pays off. So now I'll just like uh, introduce, uh, uh, like do the formal introduction, um, starting with Professor uh, Dr. Fred Finkelstein, who's a clinical professor of medicine, Yale University uh, Medical School. Uh, he was chair of peritoneal dialysis committee, uh, International Society of Nephrology. Uh, from 2006 to 2009. Uh, he was chair of CME program of ISN from 2009 to 2017 and the chair of the International Liaison Committee ISPD 2006 to 2019. We have Professor Dr. Edwina Brown with us. Uh, she is an honorary professor of renal uh, 
Medicine, Imperial uh, College, uh, London, and a consultant nephrologist at the Imperial College Renal and Transplant Center, Hammersmith Hospital, London. Um, she's the president elect of ISPD and served as chair of the ISPD guideline committee. Uh, we also have the honor of having the past president of ISPD, Dr. Teitelbaum, uh, with us, uh, who is uh, professor of internal medicine, nephrology, and director of uh, home dialysis uh, program at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver, Colorado. Um, uh, we have uh, Miguel Gallardo, uh, who uh, has been helping us with this program, and I uh, really want to take um, uh, just a few seconds to thank him uh, for uh, helping us with the program. Uh, so. Now let me uh, introduce uh, the panelists uh, and participants. Uh, one thing uh, needless uh, is to say that uh, Dr. Ahad Kayum uh, was the driving force behind setting up uh, this meeting for all of us. He is a medical director and consultant and nephrologist at Beria Town International Hospital and founding member of PD Academy. And uh, so, so that, that uh, really is something that we have developed in the past uh, year or so uh, the PD Academy and and, uh, and that hopefully will help uh, um, uh, to work on this uh, initiative. Uh, Professor Nassar Anwar uh, is another uh, panelist and uh, he's a professor of nephrology at uh, Rahman Medical Center Shower, uh, and former president of PSN. He's one of the pioneers of PD in Pakistan Especially, uh, there's a province KPK, Khaber uh, Pakhtunkhwa. So uh, he has uh, initiated uh, PD uh, there. Professor Noman Tarif, we all know him. Uh, he's a professor of nephrology at Fatima Med Memorial uh, Hospital, Lahore. He's former general secretary of PSN and chief editor of Pakistan Journal of Kidney Disease. Uh, uh, which recently released a supplementary issue, supplement issue on PD in Pakistan. And I encourage everybody to really uh, go and uh, look at it or read it uh, because it, it will give you a very good idea about the challenges that we are facing uh, in Pakistan. Uh, Professor Dr. Fred Finkelstein wrote an article and uh, he uh, uh, made me a co-author uh, uh, of, of, on that article, which I thought that I didn't deserve to be, but uh, I, I uh, could not say no to him. Uh, then uh, we have, he's also, uh, uh, Professor Noman Tarif is also uh, a founding member of PD Academy. Uh, we have Professor Ali Asghar uh, here, uh, who's a professor in our world famous uh, Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplant. SIUT, and he is also chief of pediatric nephrology there. He has served as a treasurer of PSN for the last eight to nine years. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we were just told that Dr. Farooq Omar, who is from Al Khan, he, is, he got sick and he's uh, not going to be able to join us. But he is, he's a great person and he has been a, a very uh, uh, passionate and, and uh, uh, leading the charge uh, in PD in, in the province of Sindh. Uh, Ahan, as we all know, is, a, <coughs> is an institute where which people in Pakistan uh, uh, look towards. I mean, if they, they are trendsetters, if they, and the PD, they are now doing PD, so that kind of like reassures people. Uh, so we have Dr. Mohsen Riaz, uh, who's a consultant nephrologist at Fatima Memorial Hospital. And he uh, he leads a PD program there. He did his PD training in China as an ISN fellow uh, on one of the uh, largest PD units of Asia. So this is our panelist, uh, and and then I'm just going to just in 30 seconds give you the program and the ground rules. Uh, so we will have a first case presentation by Dr. Ahad on late referrals and poor patient selection. The second case will be. Uh, by Dr. Mohsen Riaz. And after each case presentation, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Finkelstein, um, after first case, and Professor Dr. Brown, after second case, will give a 10 minute talk, uh, followed by QA session and panelist discussion. We would like all the panelists to 
really uh, give their input and, and uh, participate because uh, they are the one who are on the ground and uh, know the ground reality and the challenges that uh, uh, PD is facing there. All right, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, before I start, I would just like to thank the ISPD and the International Liaison Committee, Professor Teitelbaum, Professor Finkelstein and Brown, uh, for the guidance and support in organizing this uh, collaborative effort. As mentioned previously, these webinars are in a case-based fashion uh, through which we aim to not only have an academic discussion, but to highlight um, you know, factors which are major obstacles to PD utilization in Pakistan, and then hopefully come up with a strategy um, to cope with such problems. So without further ado, um, let me just jump into the case. I have already been introduced. My name is Ahad, and I am a kidney doctor at the Barrier Town International Hospital, Lahore. So my case starts at 3.45 p.m. when I receive a phone call from the, a professor of general surgery at a different hospital who says that, you know, over the phone says that, you know, he's heard that I still do peritoneal dialysis at our center. He's got an 18-year-old end-stage renal disease patient in his clinic who hasn't had hemodialysis for the last two weeks because does not, he, uh, he, uh, she does not have um, a functional AV fistula. Um, he goes on to report that he, the patient has seen multiple, of, uh, multiple doctors in the last two weeks um, who have made eight unsuccessful attempts to pass a temporary vascat, that is a hemodialysis catheter. He says that you know, the, the patient does have a venogram at ham, hand and that does not look too encouraging. Uh, he reports that the patient doesn't look too well to him um, and was wondering whether I could help. I said that I will try my best, but uh, in the first instance, considering that the patient has missed quite a few sessions for, for of her hemodialysis, the patient needs to go to the A and D right away so that we can have some, um, you know, workup for hyperkalemia and metabolic uh, acidosis. Um, I do not hear from every, anyone from in the next 24 hours. And while I am doing my next outdoor clinic at the hospital, um, this patient shows up accompanied by um, the mother. And she clearly appears that she's, not, she's lost a lot of weight. The patient appears acidotic, pale, and overloaded. I note that you know, there are, she has had two AVF failures and an AV graft, which failed uh, four months ago. I ask her that how come she didn't show up yesterday uh, and why is she in the clinic when I precisely said that, you know, you need to go to the A&E. Uh, she goes on to say that, you know, uh, she wanted to have a word with me, um, you know, in person, in the privacy of, an, in, of the office. Um, and what she wanted to say was that she, everybody she's met has discouraged her from going on to peritoneal dialysis. Everybody that she has met, each and every doctor have said that peritoneal dialysis is not a good modality and the life expectancy is not more than two weeks. She has seen an interventional radiologist in the last 24 hours who has promised that she, he might be able to um, you know, pass a right, uh, stent into the right, right subclavian vein and has advised admission for the time that you know, she was seeing me in clinic. Uh, I look at the venogram that is three months old which she's brought with us and that shows uh, total bilateral subclavian stenosis. Um, I go on to counsel the patient uh, for about the merits and uh, limitations of peritoneal dialysis and also to, to explain that in the current scenario where she's unable to lie flat, I do not think anybody would be able to sort of do any intervention. Um, I myself was actually doubting that I might be able to do acute PD in this patient because clearly she can't even, you know, uh, you know uh, recline at a 45 degree angle. Um, so I fail miserably and the patient keeps on asking me that if peritoneal dialysis was the only solution, why is everybody saying that, you know, it's not a good modality and why is everybody against it? And, you know, she, in the end, she just says the stenting is all that she wants. I give a call to the referring general surgeon and sort of explain everything. And he seems to also think that peritoneal dialysis is not a good option, although he had actually referred the patient to me because of peritoneal dialysis. And um, he seems to think that a stenting is the way to go. So 72 hours passed, um, you know, I'm doing my next clinic in, in the hospital and I receive a call from the A&E that there is this patient who does not, who I have seen in three days ago and I had advised acute PD. 
Um, and our, all my notes are there and they say that this patient does not have a pulse anymore and is having gasping respiratory effort. She hasn't had dialysis in the last three weeks, clearly doesn't have any, any AV access. Uh, the code blue, true, code blue team is actually doing CPR now and my chief renal resident is on site. And this is the ECG that this patient has prior uh, at her presentation, she shows sine waves, um, depicting hyperkalemia. And the ABG shows severe metabolic acidosis with a pH of 6.9 and a bicarb of 8.2. Um, you know, uh, the serum potassium come in and that's 7.1. Um, the CPR is ongoing. The patient has a G very poor GCS, uh, 5 by 15 at best. The patient is intubated and the calcium gluconate ampules are being given every 10 minutes. Um, along with IV sodium bicarbonate and a decreasing, decreasing potassium regimen that includes insulin and dextrose water. Um, after quite a bit of time and a lot of calcium gluconate and IV bicarb, we note that we can feel a pulse now when ROSC is achieved. Um, at this point, uh, where we have an emergency meeting with the intensivist and we think that we need to look for a solution, we need to do some sort of dialysis. Um, I ask for a Tenkoff catheter, but it isn't available in the pharmacy because these uh, peritoneal dialysis has to be paid out of pocket for each patient from, from the po patient's pocket. So all we have available are these uh, stiff catheters that have these stillets. So I pass that catheter and start acute peritoneal dialysis via the, you know, the old stiff catheters that we have. I do achieve quite a significant success. A serum creatinine starts settling after 24 to 48 hours. The metabolic acidosis has resolved. The hyperkalemia has resolved as well. And the patient has started to wake up. So a good save there and the patient is extubated. Uh, looking at, you know, what holds in the future, we, um, you know, now the Swan Neck 10 cough catheter is available. I pass that catheter and we switch the patient on to chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. So for up till this point, this, uh, you know, the story seems quite, you know, her heroic save. Unfortunately, because the patient had poor vascular access while the CPR was ongoing, um, you know, uh, the IV calcium or the IV bicarb that would have been probably given to this patient led to probable extravasation into the skin, uh, led to a lot of lesions in her left arm. They already had poor vascular access in that arm uh, and developed gangrene there. And the arm, unfortunately, had to be amputated. So a lot of points to ponder, ponder. The first thing is that this is just one story, one of many, which any uh, you know physician who practices peritoneal dialysis in Pakistan will say that this is you know how you know everybody treats peritoneal dialysis as a last resort, as we saw with this patient who came to my clinic recently. As you can see, both arms have fistulas who have failed. There they are perm cats marks. He has was on hemodialysis for quite a while, and now because all the AV accesses have you know, been exhausted and this patient has been referred that can you do peritoneal dialysis on this patient. So just to take you back to my patient, I just want you to sort of consider the amount of expenditure, whether it is financial, psychological, physical, that the patient had to endure. I can't, I shudder to think about the pain that the patient had to endure with all these hemo, eight attempts for, to pass VASCATs, AVFs, which failed, IV bicarb and IV calcium gluconate, which extravasated and that eventually led to the amputation of the arm. I mean, the, you know, that is taxing on the body. And I, I just can't even shudder to think about the pain that this, these patients had to endure. And the frustrating bit is that all of this could have been easily avoided had the patient been given accurate information and the patient had been referred to a peritoneal dialysis center, you know, in a timely fashion. And the patient was young, teen, lean, I mean, you know, that, that, that she would have been an ideal, uh, you know, patient for PD first. In hindsight, I think we could have done e things easily better if she had just been referred at, at an earlier time, maybe within a week of the, you know, when nephrologist decided that no further AV access is viable. Um, if he had been provided accurate information regarding peritoneal dialysis, if the logistics would, that would have allowed, given me enough time to arrange the logistics to get the catheters uh, on site. And, you know, even if I did have to do a QPD in that patient, but at least I would have done it on my terms rather than doing it on a patient who has no pulse and is being ventilated. 
I do think that the outcome would have been better as we saw with this patient actually, who was referred to me within four days of the referring nephrologist thinking that no, this patient does not have any further a viable AV access. And we did do acute peritoneal dialysis on this patient with the Swan at 10 Goff catheter. And she is still with us and doing quite well one year post switch from HD to PD. But still, PD cannot be looked at as a last resort modality. Uh, we actually uh, just want to briefly touch on this study that we were supposed to present in Milan. So because that didn't happen because of the COVID scenario, uh, it had to be done virtually. Uh, so we, what we did was we just looked at the six month, six, six month uh, mortality data of patients who we shifted from hemo on to peritoneal dialysis only or solely because they had exhausted the AV accesses. And the, you know, that the figure is astounding. The six month mortality for such patients is greater than 50%. Um, so in a country where PD is already str uh, struggling to gain, gain popularity, we need to be very selective in starting our patients on this modality. Only then, then the true benefits of peritoneal dialysis can be exhibited in our patients. So un unfortunately, what I'm trying to get at is that peritoneal dialysis in Pakistan is in a vicious cycle. So what happens is that when a patient ends up on dialysis, we just, you know, don't even counsel the patient regarding peritoneal dialysis. We just switch them to HD and spends the X amount of time on hemodialysis. The patient develops a little cardiovascular complications. And once all the AV accesses, as we saw in our patients are exhausted, in the presence of all these cardiovascular complications, then we shift the patient on to peritoneal dialysis. Now, eventually the patient does die of usually of non-PD related of a non-PD related event, but everybody seems to think that the, the patient has died because of peritoneal dialysis and that gives PD a bad name. So we cannot think of PD as an only option, you know, as an option only if HD is no longer an option. So PD has to be advocated right at the beginning when the VR, you know, patient is in CKD stage five or four, the patient needs to be counseled adequately. I thank you for your time. So, so th th that was a harrowing case, which um, for us who come from other countries, um, we fortunately never have to see. Um, th though I do remember people, and I still get people referred to us for PD because they've completely run out of vascular access. Um, people who have not wanted PD in the past um, who, who get transferred to us. So I think we next move on to um, Fred Finkelstein's talk um, about patient selection. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about patient selection for peritoneal dialysis. First, let me start by showing you this slide. This is from the cryo study where we looked at patient eligibility for PD in a cohort of 1,300 patients with advanced CKD in the United States and Canada. And we asked the nephrology teams to evaluate whether patients were candidates for hemo. PD or a transplant. And you can see here that almost everyone's a candidate for HD as we'd expect. But 85% of the patients were candidates for peritoneal dialysis and but 50% for transplantation. So let's look around the world and see what's happening globally. There's variable home dialysis and PD utilization. And that was shown in this slide from the USRDS from 2018. In the United States, where finances really drive practice patterns, about nine to 10 percent of patients are maintained on PD. In countries where they have good CKD education and more of a patient-centered care model, in European countries, Canada and Australia, about 20 to 25 percent of patients are maintained on home therapies. And in countries where government policy dictates uh, practice patterns. Um, and they have PD first programs such as Hong Kong and Thailand, about 80 to 85% of patients are maintained on PD. So this slide, the orange shows home dialysis, the dark orange is PD, and you can see the vast majority of home therapy is done with perineal dialysis. So in Hong Kong, where they have a PD first policy, and as well as Thailand, 
that this policy says that when patients who start on dialysis, they have to start on PD unless there's an absolute contraindication, otherwise the government won't pay. And in this model, 75 to 80% of patients are maintained on perineal dialysis. Now you might wonder that if patients, if, if a country starts such a policy, what happens to patient survival and technique survival? And the right-hand panel shows what happened in Thailand when they started their PD-first policy. The dotted line shows that both patient survival and technique survival improved after the PD-first policy was implemented. That presumably occurred because facilities got more experience managing patients with PD. So outcomes actually improve when the PD-first policies are implemented. In Mexico, in Jalisco State, PD utilization had peaked at about 90% because there were almost no hemodialysis facilities. So again, 90% of patients with end-stage kidney disease could be maintained on PD in this state in Mexico. As hemo units expanded, that number dropped to 50%. But importantly, in Mexico, the cost of PD is very low. The government does the contracting and the and there is competition from a local Mexican company. This is the power of the single payer. The government's contracting for PD supplies and there's a local manufacturer of PD solutions. So the cost is really very low, less than $3 for a two liter bag. In countries where there's good CKD education um, programs, and there's really an emphasis on patient-centered care, about 20 to 25% of patients are maintained on home therapies. And again, the vast majority on PD. So this is a slide from several years ago from the Netherlands, where they looked at 1,300 patients starting on PD, and where patients were given the option of starting on PD and HD. And you can see in this model, 38% of the patients started on perineal dialysis. And if you look at Canada in the province of Ontario, where they've made a big push to grow home therapies, They've peaked now at about 25, 26% of patients of dialysis being maintained on home therapies. And again, the vast majority of these are maintained on perineal dialysis. So are there really contraindications to perineal dialysis? Well, really the only one that's an absolute contraindication is the patient does, have, does not have a residence that permits PD. So if the patients were homeless, for example, or patient lives in just terrible home circumstances where they can't um, store supplies or practice any hygienic practices, then that would be an absolute contraindication. Previous major abdominal surgeries, intra-abdominal catastrophes, intra-abdominal inflammation are relative contraindications. And you have to be careful that adhesions are not present, which permit, pre prevent the free distribution of fluid through the abdominal cavity. Morbid obesity, large abdominal or hernias, Ostomies, conduits, large aortic aneurysm are relative contraindications. They're not absolute contraindications because these can be overcome. We can um, place catheters in obese patients and adjust the dialysis regimen. Abdominal hernias can be repaired. Ostomies and conduits, if they're carefully, ma carefully monitored and, and hygiene is carefully done, that's not, PD can be done successfully. And large abdominal aneurysms are just a relative contraindication. There are other relative barriers to PD, physical barriers, insufficient strength, insufficient dexterity, impaired vision and mobility, poor health and frailty, poor hygiene. But again, none of these are absolute contraindications and these can be overcome with good training. Cognitive barriers include poor history of non-adherence, language barriers, psychiatric illness, or dementia. But again, these are relative. Good family support, good training, these can be overcome. So in a patient-centered care model of shared decision-making, where we focus on individual patients and their concerns, values, and goals, patients really make the decisions of what type of dialysis they would have. So are the outcomes really different between HD and PD? And what about the impact on health-related quality of life? So the data is very clear on this. There really are no significant mortality differences between HD and PD. This is from the USRDS from 2019. The light line is PD outcomes and the dark line is HD. And we're looking at deaths per thousand patient years. You can see that both HD and PD outcomes have improved. PDs improve more significantly than HD. And if anything, there's a slight survival advantage that's really not significant from PD compared to HD. 
And if we look at health-related quality of life measures, there really is, are no significant differences if we look at standard health-related quality of life measures, such as SF36 scores, physical composite scores, mental composite scores. But if we look at the burden of the illness on patients, it is clear that there is less burden of dialysis for patients on PD compared to HD. And this has been looked at in several studies. So why have outcomes on PD improved recently? And I give you several reasons, which are shown on this slide. And I think a lot of this has to do with the impact of international guidelines that have spelled out very carefully how perinata should be managed, exercise infection should be managed, and catheters should be placed, for example, psychosocial support should be provided, a better understanding of the dose of dialysis, and better management of ultra attrition. And a lot of this is covered in the recent issue of Perineal Dialysis International, which looks at performing high quality PD. And there was an international group that formed to do this under the chairmanship of Dr. Brown. And very detailed guidelines are given in this, in this, out, in, in this issue of PDI. And again, this can be found on the ISPD website that talk about the practicing high quality PD. So let me summarize. The vast majority of end-stage kidney disease patients are candidates for perineal dialysis, 85 to 90%. There are few contraindications for PD, and most of these can be overcome with careful management. There is variable utilization of PD globally. Outcomes of PD and HD are similar in terms of mortality, but there are certain advantages to perineal dialysis in terms of the negative impact on patients' um, quality of life. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fred, um, for a very informative talk. We've got um, one or two questions turning up in the Q&A, but before we go on to those, I think it'd be useful for us to know who the audience is. So we've um, prepared a couple of polls, um, which we're now going to show you. Can you show them, Miguel? So we want you to tick this on, on your um, device or screen or whatever. What is your professional profile? Are you a doctor with PD patients, nurse with PD patients, doctor no PD patients, and nurse no P or other? And then just press submit. So um, most of the highest number are doctors with PD patients. Um, it's nice to see, to see some nurses on, on the webinar. Um, and, and then we have, and, and next webinar in January, please spread the word around that nurses are very welcome because PD is done by nurses and not by doctors. Um, and can we have the next poll, please, Miguel? So we want to know what part of um, Pakistan you, you come from. So I don't know whether you want to say anything, Ahad. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so this actually just—I was actually expecting this because this uh, this actually shows the interest in various parts of Pakistan regarding peritoneal dialysis. So I'm not surprised because in Punjab actually in the region of Punjab actually that is where peritoneal dialysis is being practiced the most at the moment, and Balochistan doesn't have any PD program at the moment, so, and Sindh has it. So, so I think that is pretty representative of what is happening in the country, and that is that sort of shows the interest as well. Okay. So, so um, we will now throw this open to um, the case and, and the talk open to discussion. Um, so, so there's, there's one question here on the Q&A. For how long can we continue acute PD and when should the catheter be taken out? Um, oh. Let me start by answering that, that. The recommendations from the ISPD, which again are on the ISP website for the use of PD 
for acute kidney injury recommends inserting a cuff catheter rather than the rigid catheters. So uh, it, it was unfortunate that the, the way the government reimbursement works, you have to buy the um, cuff catheter. So that's a challenge. So the cuff catheters are a problem. They cost about $100. We've looked at that from the Saving Own Lives program of the ISN and ISPD. And we can't get the cost down much below that. And that's unfortunate. But the recommendation would be that you use the cuff catheter because they can stay in indefinitely. The acute stick catheters are generally removed four to five to six days, for example, after they're placed because the risk of infection goes up when those catheters are left in, as I think you did in the management of your particular patient before you put the cuff catheter in. So if, if you've put in a cuff catheter, you can just leave the catheter in and transfer the person over to maintenance peritoneal dialysis once you're away from the acute phase. So Arhad, what happened to your patient in the long term? You, you got us as far as putting in the swan neck catheter. Did, did, did she survive or...? No, so unfortunately, she did not survive. So uh, I think after she had the amputation of the arm, I was able to dis uh, discharge her, but I think the wound got septic as well. Um, I, I think I didn't mention it in the um, in, in that because the cause of renal failure in her case was type one diabetes. So we, I, and I don't think that she was able to control her diabetes with all these um, uh, glucose-based solutions available. And I, I, getting access to insulin may have been a problem as well because when I saw her two weeks post discharge, her wound still looked septic, and I think she needed debridement again. Um, and after that, I haven't heard back from her. But the last night, when I my nurse talked to the family, they said that she's not more and she's no more in the. So, so how did we get to the awful situation of somebody willing to go with no dialysis, despite the option of peritoneal dialysis, and actually dying as 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 a result? Why has peritoneal dialysis got such a bad name? Do you think there would be any role for patients who've been on peritoneal dialysis to talk to other patients or set the scene or? So, so I think I've, you've hit the nail on the head. In, in my opinion, uh, that is the way forward. And the only way peritoneal dialysis has grown slowly and steadily is that, you know, even our hemodialysis patients have seen these PD patients coming to our clinic and they've seen that they look better even with, you know, even though they were on hemodialysis for seven to eight years and they don't, you know, even the color of their skin, they're less uremic, they're eating more, um, even with fluid restriction. So when these patients talk to hemodialysis and that is why at our centers, we still do quite a few PD catheters. Even yesterday we did two PD catheters. And I think you know, the patient is actually the perfect advertisement that if the patient is doing well, that, you know, that speaks volumes. Um, and uh, if you talk to anyone in Pakistan who has no experience in peritoneal dialysis, uh, what they will say is that it causes peritonitis. They won't say it's adequate or not. All they'll say is that it is, it's, it's known to cause peritonitis. That is the, that is the clear, and, you know, clear answer that they receive. Can, Can I, I just uh, add uh, something here? Sure. Sorry. Um, I think the most important factor other than, you know, the patients is the, uh, is the team, the nursing team. Uh, the the one who keeps on talking to the patient, reinforcing and re-educating them how to take care of the uh, dialysis, the whole modality, and how to do the things properly in the right way. And this is how we were able to, you know, successfully do the program over, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, the only reason was the Fresenius had provided us a, a coordinator who used to go all over Punjab and, you know, take care of the patients, you know, visit them home visits, et cetera. And I think developing a program is going to uh, help in sustainability of the peritoneal dialysis in any area. Well, that's why I think the lesson from Thailand is so important that when they put in their PD first policy, both technique and patient survival really improved. So it's an idea of getting experience, developing a team approach, like you just mentioned, Naman. And that's critically important. And that can decrease the complications and make the therapy at least much more acceptable from a patient and clinician standpoint. Yeah, I want to add a couple of things. I mean, we obviously have to have a multi-prong approach in this uh, area. And as we were just talking before the meeting that 
uh, government support uh, is, is crucial as well as uh, some policies have to come, come out uh, from, from the government side. And second is that media, I mean, you can have that many, so many patients telling so many patients that PD is great, but I think that we need to involve media uh, at, at a very uh, higher level and, and, and strongly so that we, we can tell people that this is a good modality people do well on this modality, just like look at what we just uh, saw. I mean, the uh, case that I had presented is, is horrible. And, and, uh, and if, we, if we keep getting these kind of cases uh, for, for PD, then the results outcomes are going to be horrible also. So how uh, PD is going to get a good name if we have uh, keep on have, uh, like uh, doing the same cycle again and again? So, so that is where I think that we have to bring the government, we have to bring the cost down, we have to get the media involved, we have to get the nephrologist, the primary care, the primary care is not that strong in Pakistan, but the primary care physicians should be able to kind of educate the patients and so should the nephrologist. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach. It's not a simple solution that we will get by one or two uh, changes. Okay, so there's, we're running out of time. There's one or two questions. There's a lot of questions on the question and answer about um, support from the ISPD for education. Um, and maybe, and, and what I suggest at, at the end, after the next discussion, if um, Dr. Teitelbaum says something, you know, from the International Liaison Committee about how we can, how the ISPD can support people um, with, with scholarships and things. So I'm just giving you a bit of warning, Isaac. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and otherwise, there's, there's a question about if somebody loses all their vascular access, um, should we be putting them onto PD or offering conservative care? Um, and, and I think that's an impossible question to answer. Um, it has to depend on the circumstances of the individual person in front of you. Um, as to their general health. But I'll just tell you the story of one of patients that I looked after who was on home hemodialysis for 20 years. Um, and he ran out of all vascular access. He was a man in his um, 40s by this, or 50s by the time I met him. Um, and uh, he ran out of all vascular access and he transferred to peritoneal dialysis and then spent 10 years on peritoneal dialysis. So if, if um, un until he died from in fact, from you know, just general ill health by that point. Um, and interestingly, his wife, or widow rather, you know, is, is now on peritoneal dialysis. Um, and, and she selected that, having seen her husband both on hemo and on PD. Um, so it, I, I can't, it's all about discussion with the, with the patient. Um, and, and, then, and then there's one or two few questions about um, costs of fluids and, and the webinar um, in January is yeah. going to much more focus on those sort of issues in in Pakistan. So I'm not going to answer those, those today, um, but it's a reason why you should log on to the webinar on January the 12th. So shall we move on to the... Zina, let me make one last comment. Yeah. I, I yeah. think the slide I showed from the USRDS in 2018 on international comparisons is very useful. And I think it's worth looking at because many lower income countries um, also have a, a significant percentage of patients maintained on perineal dialysis. So the cost is an issue that needs to be thought about. And Pakistan is distinctive in a sense that there's such a low penetration for PD. So that issue really should be changed. And I, I think if you if that could be done from a government and nephrology standpoint, like Kamar mentioned. Okay. Should we move on to the second case? Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I am Dr. Mohammad Mohsin Riyaz. I am in charge of the peritoneal dialysis program at Fatima Memorial Hospital Lahore. The peritoneal dialysis program in Pakistan is in the phase of evolution, and we are facing a different set of problems as compared to the developed world. Many consultants in Pakistan are committed to promote the PD culture in Pakistan. The outflow structure remains a common cause of the PD failure across the world. So today we will discuss a case related to the outflow structure, and we will see how to manage such cases. 
We had a 68 years old male. He was diagnosed with diabetes for 25 years, hypertensive for 20 years, and CKD for three years. He was on a regular follow-up, and we planned for renal replacement therapy due to progression of the disease. He was started on hemodialysis through arteriovenous fistula in August 2020. He had primary arteriovenous fistula failure, and he was consulted for peritoneal dialysis. Laparoscopic peritoneal dialysis catheter was placed in September 2020. On table free inflow and outflow was documented. Peritoneal cavity was irrigated using one CEPD bag with 500 ml dwell volume and no stay time. On the first post operative day, rapid PD exchanges were done with one bag using 500 ml dwell volume and with no stay time. There was good inflow and good outflow. Dressing was done, X ray abdomen was done as a routine to document the position. Patient remained asymptomatic and he was discharged in the evening. So this is the x-ray that was done on the first post-operative day. You can see the catheter tip lying in the deep pelvis. There is no kink in the catheter. No exchanges were done on the second post-operative day. The patient was contacted telephonically to assess the clinical, any active clinical issues. There was no active complaints. He was inquired about the bowel movement and he was reinforced to take his medicine in laxative shoes. On the third post-operative day, we planned a home visit to do quick, quick exchanges to examine the wood and dressing if needed. The inflow was good, but the outflow was very slow. Considering the early post-operative period that may lead to poor mobility and poor bowel movements, laxatics were prescribed. The patient was re-evaluated on the fourth post-operative day. The post-frequency frequency was evaluated. He told a better bowel movement. We attempted to exchange using 500 ml dwell volume with no stay time. There was a good inflow, but no outflow. So he was planned for hospital visit for further evaluation and management. On the fifth post-operative day, the patient came to the hospital where we performed X-ray abdomen and pelvis. The catheter was lying in the deep, deep pelvis. There was no obvious kink. We attempt, attempted flushing the catheter with 500 ml saline. Inflow was good, but there was no outflow. The catheter was locked using 1 cc heparin in 9 cc normal saline and left for 24 hours. We increased the laxatives to ensure a good bowel movement. So this is the x-ray. You can see the catheter tip lying in the deep pelvis and there is no king in the catheter. The bowel shadows are distended, showing the distended gut, small gut. And we can conclude the patient as was having constipation and there might be some small gut wrapping around the catheter. On the sixth post-operative day, we again called the patient. We again done the X-ray abdomen to rule out the catheter position and to assess the status of the small gut. We tried to flush the fluid, but we failed. There was good inflow, but there was no outflow. We locked the catheter with 250,000 units of SK in 8cc of normesiline, and we left it for two hours. After two hours, we attempted to flush, but we failed again. There was no outflow despite very good inflow. We again locked the catheter with SK and left it for 24 hours. So this is the exit on the sixth post-operative day. Here you can again see the catheter tape lying in the deep pelvis. The small gut is distended and we increase the laxatives considering this X-ray. On the seventh post-operative day, catheter was flush again. There was persistent outflow failure and now we suspected the a mental wrap and we planned a laparoscopic repositioning of the catheter. The patient was consulted and appointment given for the laparoscopic reposition and he was sent home. On the very next day, patient noticed a blackish fluid in the catheter. We at attempted a forceful, forceful flush flushing, but there was no inflow at this time. There was a retrocalate of the dead blackish fluid and the fluid came out through the exit side. And now we suspected that the tunnel has infected after this retrograde flow and we planned the catheter removal on the next day. So this is a blackish tinge colored fluid that was noticed in the PD catheter by the patient at home. The major differentials in this case are a mental wrap, fibrin plug, and the external fibrin sheath encasing the PD catheter, although it is a very low, lower down the list. So this was the catheter that was removed and you can see the catheter is totally choked up and there is pus lying on the outside of the catheter. So we face some shortcomings in this case. The catheterography was not performed. We didn't use TPA because it was very expensive and not widely available. One TPA vial cost equal to three PD catheters in Pakistan. The urokinase was not available at that time. 
So what better could have been done? If we would have done the prophylactic amantopexy, the outcome would have been better. And we might not end it up with losing the PT catheter. The catheter malfunction is defined as the mechanical failure in dialysate inflow or outflow. The outflow failure ranges from 4 to 34-5% overall, and it is related to the technique used. It is 10 to 22% using the open technique, blind trocar technique, or blind guidewire technique. And it is 4 to 13% in laparoscopic insertion. 20% of the patients are shifted to hemodialysis due to catheter-related problems. The major causes of the outflow failure include a mental wrap, tip migration. The other causes may include fibrin of blood within the glumen, catheter kinking, small bubble wrapping, intraperitoneal adhesions, occlusion by the fimbria in the female patients, pericatheter leak, and peritonitis. So, once you have documented that the patient is having outflow failure, which is defined as an inability <clears throat> to drain peritoneal dialysis effluent consistently within 45 minutes, the first thing to do is to inspect the dialysis color. So, you have to rule out peritonitis, which can be done using the TLC and DLC, and if you notice a cloudy dialysis. Next, we have to rule out catheter tip dislocation and the constipation, which can be done using the abdominal x-ray. Then we might have the dialysis leakage, which usually presents as the fluid at the exit side, pleural fluid, swelling of the abdominal wall, and the genital swelling. And it can be further evaluated and conf confirmed using CT peritoneography and MR peritoneography. The outflow failure can occur through the membrane failure, although this is very remote and rare cases, and it is not an early complication. Then comes the catheter obstruction related to fibrin, blood clot, kinking, or mental and adjacent organ wrapping. This is an early complication, and it presents in initial four to six weeks. The first thing to do is we can use the fibrin agents to clear up the catheter if uh, there is an evidence of fibrin in the dialysate. Then we can perform the catheterography to rule out a mental wrapping. And the further and the final step is do a laparoscopy in which we can uh, do a visual inspection and we can do appropriate management. So these, X, these are the radiographs showing the catheterography. This is a normal function catheter in which the dye is inserted through the catheter and images are taken at 10 seconds. This is 30 seconds, then two minutes and four minutes. You can see a free dispersion of the contrast media in the deep pelvis. So now this is a plain X-ray abdomen in a patient with a mental wrap and you can see the catheter coming down deep into the pelvis and there is no obvious kinking in the catheter. So you cannot command and you cannot diagnose a mental wrap using a plain abdominal pelvis x-ray. So this is the same patient in which we did a catheterography and you can see the images taken at 10, 30 seconds and 22 minutes and the 4 minutes. Here the, cat the dye is not dispersed freely into the deep pelvis. So it is lying along the, it is the retained along the catheter line. So it suggests there is some kind of wrapping around the catheter which is not allowing the contrast to freely disperse. So this image is showing a rare case of PD catheter encasement by extra luminal fibrin sheet. You can see that the injected contrast is seen tracking retrograde along the catheter to the site of the spillage in the lower left quadrant. Here, this is whole fibrin sheet that is encasing the PD catheter. The salvage procedure that can be done to save, in the case of our malfunctioning PD catheter, this includes cathartics, enemas, rapid flushing, fibrinolytics, and fluoroscopic manipulation. And, and if these conservative management fails, you can do a surgical technique using the open surgical technique or laparoscopy. Coming towards the pendal wrapping, the omentum is considered as the police officer of the abdomen, and omental wrapping presents between 24 to 48 hours of the catheter insertion. And this, the incidence reach, ranges from 4.5 to 15%. It usually presents with low inflow, blocked outflow, and the high risk patients are emaciated patients with thinned out momentum and patients with bulky momentum reaching the rectovesical pouch. 
the prophylactic omentopexy is a technique in which the omental fixation is done onto the parietal peritoneum during the CAPD catheter insertion. The limited data is available on this topic. The open surgical omentopexy was first described in 1985 by McIntosh et al. as an omental hitch procedure. In this procedure, they sutured the free edge of the omentum to the abdominal wall in epigastric region using an open incision. They compared two groups of 12 patients each. They reported a 17% incidence of catheter obstruction in comparison to 66% in whom the procedure was not performed. So it was a great breakthrough. And then comes the laparoscopic omentopexy. It was first described in 1996 by Crabtree et al. And they performed this procedure in five patients in which they were just doing a laparoscopic salvage surgery. And they performed this procedure in the patient when they came across redundant, thin, and filmy momentum. And no catheter obstruction was reported in their patients. The prophylactic omentopexy was the first case series related to prophylactic omentopexy came in 2001 from Ogun et al. They performed this procedure in 10 patients and they were followed up for nine months. And there was no complication noted. They used an automated suture device in their procedure. A major trial for the prophylactic omentopexy came from Crabtree et al. in 2003. They compared two groups. The group one consisted of 78 consecutive patients without any mental procedure. In the group two, there were 150 patients and each patient was evaluated for the high risk for the mental wrapping. And the 14 patients were selected in which they found redundant, thin and filling momentum and they did prophylactic omentopexy. And interestingly, only one patient developed the catheter obstruction and, and uh, in the patient in whom the prophylactic omentopexy was done as compared to the 10 patients in which there was no omentopexy done. Then Ogun et al. Also, uh, disc, uh, Ogun et al. in 2003 described a major trial comparing two groups. They compared open surgical technique without mental fixation versus the laparoscopic technique without mental fixation. So they compared two groups of 21 patients each. Their trial was done in between March 1998 till October 2001. So this was a lengthy period and they uh, was equally distributed groups. No episode of catheter malfunction was observed in laparoscopic group with omental fixation, whereas 23.8% had mechanical dysfunction in open surgical group. So with the advancement in the different techniques, various improvements in the technique of the prophylactic omentopexy using the laparoscopic technique has been described, start from 1996, Crabtree et al., Ogun et al., and Crematee et al. The latest is from the material in 2018, and there are various improvements in the technique, and they, all the techniques are gradually becoming more safe, and the outcomes are better. So the high risk patients for the mental wrapping are the patients who are thinly emaciated, and while we are doing a CAPD catheter placement laparoscopically, the visual inspection gives us a clue. The patient with redundant, thin filling momentum, patient with bulky momentum filling up the pelvis, and patients in which the momentum is reaching the rectovesical port. They are all high risk patients. And prophylactic omentopexy should be performed in these patients. Now, I would like to present the data from our center. The PD center at Fatma Memorial Hospital is the first dedicated center in the Pakistan. In the last few years, we placed 28 catheters and we had the overall mechanical complication rates of 32.14%. So we faced hemoperitoneum, malposition in two patients, pericatheter leak in three patients, mental lap in three patients, and 19 patients remained asymptomatic. The majority of patients, the major complication is the mental wrap and the pericatheter leak. The pericatheter leak was uh, observed in the patient, started on urgent start peritoneal dialysis, so we used all the four techniques for the PD catheter replacement. The major technique we are used is being laparotomy or open surgical technique, and the success rate is seventy-five percent. Two patients were placed PD catheter using laparoscopic, and both in both we had a mental wrapping. 
fluoroscopy has zero complication rate the, although the patient uh, number is low but we had a very uh, successful patients and only one patient was placed pd catheter in blind trocar and we lost that catheter so the risk assessment for the mental wrapping should be done in all patients laparoscopic amentopexy is safe simple and a quick procedure prophylactic amentopexy improves pd catheter outcomes prophylactic amentopexy should be done in all thin limb patients emaciated patients patients having redundant thin epithelial momentum in patient in which momentum is filling the pelvis and patient in which the momentum is reaching the recto vesical pouch thank you the house is open for question well thank you for a really interesting case and a, a fantastic overview of, of the literature i'm not going to show my talk because i don't think it's going to add anything and we're running out of time I think the main message that came out of the talk was, first of all, the use of the ISPD guidelines. So the ISPD has um, developed guidelines for most aspects of PD, um, from including on nurse training, because I see there's a question here um, from a nurse about what does ISPD do, do for nursing. So, so there's a very good guideline about how nurses should train patients for PD. Um, guidelines on access, um, the prescribing, etc. So the access guideline was updated and published last year in 2019. And in terms of mechanical complications, which have been so well um, reviewed, it, what it says is that each unit needs to have have a you work your way through from simple conservative um, investigations, such as making sure the patient's taking a laxative. Um, through to doing, uh, if, you know, if, if there's no inflow, flushing the catheter um, with some saline, um, getting an x-ray to look at catheter position, um, and then start on more interventional things like um, doing a CT scan um, to look for position of, of the catheter, um, and then repositioning. Re re I'd, I'd rather that we spend the time really thinking about how you get catheters inserted, because I think um, getting access for PD catheters um, is, 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 is often a major hurdle to getting people onto peritoneal dialysis. Um, and and I, I'd rather hear from centers who are doing PD or thinking of doing PD, um, what they see as, as the barriers to getting PD catheters. Um, how, are you putting them in percutaneously? Is laparoscopic, which we've heard a lot about, really feasible? Um, it's a very expensive technique. Um, um, a lot of places will just do open surgical or mini laparotomies rather than, than laparoscopically. So, 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 Dr. Mohsen, you, you, you gave the talk. Did you want to sort of say anything? Uh, yes, actually, I just want to uh, highlight the thing that before you uh, place the patient and we decide once the patient is decided for the PD catheter, we have to assess for the risk versus benefit, uh, and we have to uh, assess the patient for possible complication. Uh, like if the patient is not very obese, we can use a fluoroscopic technique, but if the patient is obese and uh, you cannot do it in a local anesthesia, then preferred technique would be the laparoscopic. And the patients whom, in whom the, we are, uh, in which the PD is like a precious procedure, uh, you, you can say that this is the patient with the uh, difficult vascular access. I guess we should go for the laparoscopic and at the same time we should do a, uh, do a mentopexy. So since we have uh, all the two patients, we put on uh, put the PD catheters using the laparoscopic technique. In both of them, we had uh, we faced the uh, mental wrap, unfortunately. And otherwise, the fluoroscopic technique does very good, but it and it's uh, very uh, minimally invasive. But it uh, needs the fluoroscopic availability of the fluoroscope. And in center where the fluoroscope is not available, it becomes a, a little difficult. On the other hand, uh, uh, as we see the open surgical technique or mini laparotomy, it's also a very simple technique. And in that procedure, if you have a dedicated surgeon, if you are able to get a dedicated surgeon at your center who understands the importance of peritoneal dialysis in patients of CKD5, then it becomes very feasible and easy. Make one comment. I think it's important that you distinguish between what the optimal way to place the catheter is and what the most practical way to place the catheter. 
Um, you know, and ideally laparoscopic technique is fine and omentopexy for the patients that was covered in the talk would be ideal, but it's not always practical because it's very expensive doing the laparoscopic placements. And one thing we've learned from the Saving Young Lives program that we train people in low resource countries to put in cuff catheters, that just using it with a simple ultrasound guidance, um, the success rate is extremely high. I mean, 90% of catheters work actually very well. And it's a very easy technique to do that you can train nephrologists or actually internal medicine physicians to place these catheters. So I think you have to distinguish between optimal and what's the most practical way to place the catheters. So, so the access yeah. guideline is very clear on that. Um, it says that although the laparoscopic guide is, 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 is like the gold standard, um, you know, one has to be practical um, and pragmatic and percutaneous insertion is just as good um, in, 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 in clinical settings. And, and we certainly put in about 60% of our first catheters are put in percutaneously with ultrasound guidance. Um, and, and we reserve laparoscopy for more complex patients who are obese or previous surgery. There was a question um, that we didn't answer from the last session about, for example, cesareans. Can somebody have a PD catheter after a cesarean section? And the answer is yes. I mean, so first of all, it's an extra peritoneal procedure. Um, but and anybody who's, who's got a scar, we, 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 we will um, put it in, in laparoscopically. Um, what, what happens in your center, Ahad? Um, so so our, uh, at our center, our surgeon uh, does not put it laparoscopically. Um, he's always put it in the medial laparotomy or the medial surgical uh, the way. And uh, we can do it, you know, the percutaneous way as well. We've got the fluoroscopy suite, but we just do it because of, um, you know, the financial bit. We just do it with the help of the ultrasound and we can do it percutaneously. And our surgical team is quite helpful that if it is a really obese patient and I, I'm, I think that I might not be able to do it, then he, he helps me out there. Um, mm -hmm. One problem that I do face because this, I'll just touch on that because there was a question related to that also. Whenever I've had to do some sort of acute PD um, in a patient that I think that, you know, I can't let the catheter rest for two weeks. If the surgeon has put it in, uh, I usually end up having pericatheter leaks. Um, uh, I've sort of been in the theater with him. I think what they do is that when they do the laparotomy, I think that they open the peritoneum quite a lot and then they have to sew, uh, suture it al uh, alongside the catheter probably. So have you had any experience with that? Because with the, the, what I'm thinking is now is that if I have to do acute PD, I have to do it, uh, you know, myself. It has to be percutaneous because when we put in the sheath, at least the hole within the peritoneum is exactly the size of the catheter. Any thoughts well, on that? So we've certainly done acute PD in people with laparoscopic techniques because um, if... if I mean, we would ideally do it percutaneously because um, you can do percutaneously whenever you want. One of the yep. disadvantages of using surgeons is that you have to wait for theater space, anesthetists, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got a really sick patient, then you don't, you know, the high potassium, you can't anesthetize them, but you can put in a percutaneous catheter. Um, but people who um, like, uh, where you really can't, you've got contraindications to, uh, a percutaneous catheter, we will put it in laparoscopically. Um, and they've again got very small incisions and we can start. If you're doing a PD acutely, um, it's important to do it while the patient is lying in bed and not getting up and walking around, um, try and use lower volumes than usual. Um, we, we, we would use a cycling machine, but you, you don't have to do that. You can just do it manually. Um, and, and if the, you know, but allow a bit of time in the day for them to get up and walk around. So at that point, so that you would drain them out so, so that they've got an empty abdomen. So in terms of the other questions that I think we, we should answer is, if you've got an mental rack, can you exchange over a guide wire? And the answer is no, because uh, the guide wire will take you straight back into the mental rack. So you have to take the catheter out um, and then put another, another one in. Um, there's another one about um, if somebody's got blood in a drain bag, can they continue or stop that session? Um, so blood in a drain bag is, is common, particularly in women who ovulate 
um, and you, if, if it's really heavily blood stained after a new catheter, then you may want to put some heparin down, down the um, catheter to stop clots, but you, you should um, carry on. And then there's another question here about the use of buried catheters, and I'm going to pass that on to Dr. Teitelbaum because I think he's probably the only one who's ever used buried catheters on, on the panel. Thank you, Edwina. Um, yeah, we have had in the past particularly uh, rather extensive experience with buried, buried catheters. The advantage to the buried catheter is obviously this is a planned start. This is not something you would do when you plan on initiating peritoneal dialysis within days or even two to three weeks. But if you have a patient with CKD5 who is headed towards dialysis and patient the physician are on board that you will be doing peritoneal dialysis, burying the subcut, burying the, what will be the external portion of the catheter subcutaneously without the titanium, of course, without the transfer set, and then subsequently externalizing it is, uh, is a very useful technique. I've personally done this well over 125 times. Um, small incision, about a centimeter done under local lidocaine, and one can externalize the catheter. This obviously provides the opportunity for the catheter to heal into place and granulate into place, and you can go from no dialysis to two liters in the peritoneum on the first day without difficulty, assuming the patient can accommodate the two liters. So there's, thanks Isaac. There's another question here about what should you do when the patient's PD catheter related issues, um, you know, they can't actually do PD. Do, do they shift to hemodialysis temporarily? Or should everybody who's going on to PD have a, a, a fistula um, so that they can have backup hemodialysis? So I think the, the, the answer is, is no, you don't have to, it depends on residual kidney function. Um, if, if, and that's one of the advantages of starting PD, not as an emergency, not in people who've got absolutely no vascular access, um, but in, in people um, at CKD5 stage, when they've still got a bit of residual kidney function, um, that if, if you have problems with, with a leak where you may want to leave people dry for a couple of weeks, um, or if, if they get a catheter which has migrated, um, you've still got a bit of residual kidney function and you can avoid putting them onto hemodialysis. Um, you could always put in a, a temporary um, central line um, for hemodialysis if, if really needed. Um, I'd just like to make one other comment on the catheter placement again, is that, again, from the Saving Young Lives experience, again, where PD is used for acute kidney injury, if you use a Selvinger technique to place the catheter, the mechanical complication rate, leaks, obstruction, is about 7 to 10 percent. 90 plus percent of the catheters work extremely well. So again, with the Selvinger technique, again, we use a small needle, a guide wire, a dilator, and then the catheter placement. Leaks are actually uncommon. And these experience with the catheters used immediately after, I mean, the PD is started immediately after catheter placement. So I think many people have, don't use the buried catheter technique much anymore because of the ways of placing the catheter with the Selvinger technique and being able to use it right away. You know, and, and we get very worked up about PD catheter problems, but it's not a reason not to use PD because I'm sure you've all seen problems with fistulas that don't work um, central lines that get blocked and don't work. Um, access in dialysis is a problem for both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And there is actually one comparative study, I think it came out of China, if I remember right, looking at acute hemo and acute PD um, and, and showed that uh, there were less access related problems with PD than, than there were with hemodialysis. Before passing over um, to Dr. Teitelbaum for ISPD support, there's one question here about where can you get ISPD guidelines um, in PDF format. If you go onto the ISPD website, 
um, and then click onto guidelines. Um, there's a very nice page there. You just need to click onto the relevant guideline and you will immediately be sent on to Peritoneal Dialysis International where you will have all the guidelines are open access um, and you can then download um, the, the PDF. So there are a whole series of questions here about education and, um, and support. And I agree to get PD growing, people have to be educated um, so that you don't give the message to patients and to other nephrologists that PD um, is, is a dreadful treatment. Um, so Dr. Teitelbaum, could you say something about where, what the support the ISPD can give? Yes, thanks, Edwina. And, and I'd like to mention three programs supported by ISPD that at various stages may prove beneficial as you endeavor to launch PD programs and have people more educated about PD. Um, the first would be the International Liaison Committee, of which I am currently the, the chair. Um, Fred was chair for over a decade. We are delighted to provide in-person education when situations permit, and we are happy to conduct webinars of this nature um, in, in the interim, and perhaps it, this may be a model that we adopt for the future as well. But there is, in the end, no substitute for hands-on learning, and we would certainly entertain, I, I know Edwina and Fred participated uh, not quite a year ago um, in a uh, workshop in Sri Lanka, and there is no reason that one would not, we, we could certainly contemplate the same uh, in Pakistan or elsewhere, including hands-on components to catheter placement. The, the second program I'd like to mention is the fellowship or scholarship or fellowship program. There is a committee that will award a fellowship in which a physician and or nurse, and I would, I want to stress the nurse involvement. The ideal in my mind is if a center wishes to establish peritoneal dialysis, that that center have both a physician and the accompanying nurse go for a period of two to three months and learn peritoneal dialysis if necessary at an established center. There is a stipend of up to um, $5,000 per person available if necessary, whatever the, the, the it's not an automatic 5,000, but it's up to 5,000 and you have to apply for this, but there is information again available on the ISPD website. It's www.ispd.org, O-R-G, and there is information about that available. And the third and the one that is for the moment, the least practical, and the, but the, the one that if, in a sense becomes the idealized one, if a surgeon or interventionalist wishes to have advanced training in PD catheter placement, the day may come that you may, you may wish to embrace this. The ISPD does sponsor what's called Peritoneal Dialysis University for surgeons and interventionalists, where again, they have both the theory and the hands-on portion of uh, catheter placement. By the way, the theoretical ones, or not theoretical, they are actually being done, uh, but the theory is being offered to, not today, but even now during COVID. And there is uh, information available, I believe on the website. Miguel, am I correct? Yes, yes, you are correct. Yes, yeah, so on, on the ISPD website, there is information available about the PD University for surgeons and interventionalists. And this would be something in which the advanced laparoscopic techniques would be discussed, including things such as omentopexy, lysis of adhesions, um, simultaneous repair of uh, hernia, et cetera. And again, this is not to begin with. This would be down the road. Um, and all of these are available with ISPD support. The, the only thing to, to mention is Isaac is that the PD University with the current COVID situation is 
not uh, happening in in uh, real life and they are considering maybe a virtual version which would be accessible from Pakistan on a positive note but of course we lack the, the practical Correct. The, le the lecture component is taking place the hands-on component with the um, simulated catheter placement is not currently able to take place thanks Miguel Okay, so I think we move on to, th thank you very much, Isaac, that's, that's very helpful, is, is for uh, um, Professor Tarif to address um, less, well, what we've learned from today's webinar and, and things that we need to think about before the webinar that's going to happen on the 12th of January. Thank you very much, uh, Edwina and uh, uh, Turtle Mom and uh, Fred Finkelstein for being part of this webinar. I think... Uh, this is something uh, of a dream come true after so many years of uh, hard work and uh, a lot of work done by Dr. Ahad Kiyum and uh, Mohsen. And um, I think this is where we stand now and the, one of the question what ISPD is doing, and this is uh, the seminar that is a result of it. And uh, at the same point, I would like to urge our uh, attendees here, participants uh, to uh, you know, uh, join the membership of ISPD and there's a, like a group membership also, and there's a individual membership, you know, whatever they want uh, in terms of institution and stuff. And there's a lot of information there from ISPD. There will be support from there and in the future also, inshallah. Uh, in terms of this webinar, I think uh, it was very clear that the patients are being referred very late. And that's quite obvious here in Pakistan. And just today I saw a patient who has a creatinine that was given by the lab as more than 20. So I don't know, it is like more than 30 or what. So, uh, but she was sitting, she said, I'm feeling fine. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want to do a dialysis and I offered her PD and, you know, hemodialysis. So I don't know what will happen to her, but uh, she is not going to land uh, as uh, Dr. Ahad was saying, because the potassium was still quite okay. Uh, similarly, you know, most of our patients that we have done in our center uh, almost, I would say, just a rough guess, 70% uh, of them may have required urgent PD. And we have done, you know, like small, slow, uh, small volume uh, peritoneal dialysis in these patients and have been successful in most of them with one or two occasions of uh, pericatheter leak. And there's a lot of interest in it, and it is important for us to learn from urgent PD as uh, we face these problems of patients coming in very late to us. Just because of the uh, the uh, choice of the patient, they want to go. They don't want to go on dialysis, <clears throat> and they would like to wait, you know, till I don't know a miracle or whatever. Uh, uh, there is an interesting uh, paper I just saw that was suggesting, you know, you can put like double string around the catheter uh, to strengthen so that uh, there's no pericatheter leak in the urgent start PD. Um, in terms of you know the um, uh, the whole. Uh, uh, the setup of the dialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis, it is very important that we, uh, uh, that we, uh, that we uh, take the lead in our own centers. Like there was a question uh, in the Q&A that when the PD is going to start in Sindh. I think that's the question that you should uh, ask yourself when we are going to start the PD. I think the ISPD is here and there's a lot of guidelines there, which is most important thing in terms of any program to be successful that we have to follow the program as Dr. Mohsen was suggesting that we could have done, you know, catheterography as was mentioned. So if we had looked through these guidelines more carefully, maybe we'd have, you know, earlier done the catheterography in our patient. So ISPD has made a good uh, flow diagrams for most of these uh, practices and peritoneal dialysis. And we should, you know, try to uh, get the information which is free freely downloadable uh, from the ISPD website. Um, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the catheter issues, I think the, uh, the problem is going to be there, as was very rightly mentioned by uh, Professor Edwina, that uh, there is uh, going to be a, a problem with the fistulas, there is going to be a problem with the catheters. So we should not shy away from that. And uh, the idea of uh, showing you this case was uh, not that, you know, everybody has to go for laparoscopy. Majority of the patients are uh, going to benefit from just 
a bedside technique or a simple fluoroscopy technique of putting a catheter just with the use of an ultrasound. We have done that before ourselves in our center also. We've done with the fluoroscopy also. So, but few patients where there is some problem, you know, then you have to go for, uh, uh, for the uh, laparoscopy. And as was mentioned, you should have a good surgeon at hand. Like initially when I asked one of the surgeon to put a PD catheter and he said, oh yes, I can do that. And I was very surprised to see a PD catheter the next, next day after the post-op and there was uh, another uh, catheter coming out on the side as a drainage tube. I said, yeah, what did you do? He said, oh, there was a lot of fluid, so I just put in a drain there. So I never gave him the next catheter again to him. So I went to another surgeon who was understanding about the whole procedure. And you know we are successful in getting mini laparotomies uh, in many of our patients and uh, things like that. So overall, I think what we have to do is we have to make sure that, you know, and, you know, uh, to have, you be, but what we have to do is, you know, just uh, think that this is a doable thing. That is the first thing. And we have done so many workshops in Pakistan uh, in terms of placing the PD catheters. And yet we don't see uh, any other centers other than the C3 centers in Pakistan uh, still there. Uh, the fourth center, which is coming up, is in uh, Children's Hospital in uh, Lahore, and they're good putting in uh, PD catheters there in children and uh, doing peritoneal dialysis, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, on a final note, uh, I think government uh, support is very important, that's no doubt, and just gives you a push, as was shown in the uh, diagram from the USRDS data or, uh, or the international data where there was increase uh, support from the government. And there was, you know, like a huge number of patients who were on uh, peritoneal dialysis. So Dr. Uh, uh, Kamar is doing a great job in Pakistan for that. And we thank for him that, you know, he's putting all his effort. And uh, we look forward for uh, uh, a very uh, good journey in terms of peritoneal dialysis success and developing teams and PD Academy that was, uh, you know, founded by uh, Dr. Ahad Kayum and Dr. Mostyn and myself just to make sure that, you know, we train our nurses, the technicians and physicians. And we are at a phone call away from any center, all three of us, Dr. Kiran in uh, Islamabad and, uh, you know, Dr. Manib in Peshawar, somebody was asking in KPK, I think Dr. Manib is there who can help you out to do this thing. And I think just uh, only uh, thing is just, uh, you know, uh, let's just start the whole program and, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we make it a success story. And uh, with the next year, when we look at backwards at our data, we are able to tell that, you know, we have uh, made a success in this thing and uh, in terms of developing the PD program in Pakistan. Thank you. Okay, well, well thank you, everybody. And I look forward to meeting you all again in January the 12th in five weeks' time. Thanks, thank everyone. It was an excellent conference. Thank you. Great to have everyone's participation. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much.